Clark, I'm sure to go back to the search app. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, how's the course going? Going up? Great. Great. Excellent. So, another exciting seminar, this time by Professor Tim Squadron, who is a professor in the chemistry department. Um, he has done a lot of influential work at the intersection of chemistry and material science, in particular, pioneer bloody cells, volatile electronics that can be used for building this chemical sensor that he's going to tell me about. Uh, his work spans a, a, a wide variety of things. He's also was leading, is maybe still leading the Deschwande Center. Yes, I am the director, yeah. Uh, much innovation at MIT. There's a lot going on at Deschwande Center as well in terms of technology and innovation. Uh, the professor you know, in your science is going to tell us about very interesting things on the people. Let's turn it on for us. Okay. So anyway, I, I, it's good. I, you know, as a, as a presenter, the energy of this room actually helps people present. So it's, uh, I, your energy is really good. And, uh, and I hope you're having a good time at MIT. And uh, there's first a few special things about MIT. This is, this is simply the best playground for science and technology in the planet. And I'm glad you're here enjoying it. Hope some of you come here for, for part of your education. If you don't come as an undergraduate, you can always come as a graduate student. You don't come as a graduate student, you can sometimes be a postdoc. And, and I meet people all the time that, you know, had to wait till their postdoc where they finally could get into this place, but it was worth it. And, uh, and so it's a great place. Uh, and one of the things I think that one of the models here, I mean, I do pretty fundamental chemistry a lot of the time. We develop new reactions. We make things. We do a big span all the way from things that are really just intellectual curiosity, but one of the things that we really do well here at MIT is translate things to the world. I mean, we want to change the world. We want to do, bring technology that can improve lives, can, can save lives, can save food, as I'll talk about today, um, and just, just do good for the planet. And I think that's really the model of what people come to MIT to do, uh, to work hard to make things happen like that. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, two, Two story. I'm not actually going to hit too much on this, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, the majority of the technical stuff will be around what we call carbon nanotube sensors. But I want to tell you a little bit about what we've done in uh, explosive detection, which ended up in uh, technology that was in airports for a while. It's now been it's now mainly used by police forces and, and the military. But um, we'll tell you about that technology. Okay. So what do I mean by molecular? Electronics. So molecular electronics implies that we have molecules doing electronic function. That we're really moving to a molecular basis. And that's different than, than silicon electronics, which are basically solids, crystalline solids. Molecules are little discrete things that you make. Now, you can make the molecules really big. We call those polymers, where we put a bunch of them together and we can make things that are, you know, microns in length. And, um, and so I started this kind of journey back when I was a graduate student, I had a kind of an idea. I was thinking, like, if I'm going to frame my career and do some things, I, I should have a couple kind of outrageous goals, things that, you know, are really unattainable, but you kind of shoot for and use as kind of a model to organize your research life. And the goal I came up with, based on some kind of intuition I was developing around some materials I was working with, was the idea that I would like to create chemical sensors, okay? This, this was, I thought that there would be some real advantages in knowing our environment around us and the chemistry around us. And I thought that maybe I could make kind of the ultimate chemical sensor if I could take one of my molecules, my big molecular wires, and I could basically put it, you know, it has a repeating unit, it's a polymer, it has this repeating unit, and I could basically configure it so that I could put a group on this repeating unit that was basically interact with a molecule of interest. And when it did so, it would change the ability of this charge to migrate through that segment. So we basically make a switch, a chemical switch here that would, within the absence of this little red ball, lets this charge just run around the circuit. We have a good conductor. But when I put this little red ball in there, I basically pull up a big resistor and no current will flow. And the advantage of that is that I can have a million of these things 
all in a series, and only one of them has to be up, turned on, the whole system comes down. So it's, it's the equivalent of having a million light switches all hooked in a row, and you flip one, if they're in series, you flip one, you break the circuit. And so this seemed like a very good way to get really high sensitivity. Now, as I say, this is really inspiration. We haven't done this exactly. I mean, people have made single wire type devices. They don't usually have this kind of sophistication that we do there, but, but they're also, they get one out of a thousand of them to work. We, again, we want to do technology. We want to bring things to the real world. So this has really been inspiration, but it's a way that we've kind of thought about how we do things. So let me first just tell you a little, kind of show you some chemistry and how you might design kind of some of the more sophisticated little switches that we've had here. So here's one of my wires, okay? This has, you know, this, these, uh, these structures, these chemical structures indicate that there are delocalized pi electrons. So they're electrons that really polarize. And when you put charges into them, when you take an electron out of this, you put a charge into it, we call it a hole. We think of the hole being the conductor Okay, so the electrons are really moving, but the electrons are backfilling and it looks like the hole's moving. You could think about that just, you know, basically if you think about cars in a line, you know, the cars move, the hole moves back, right? And so, so basically these holes can move up and down this polymer and that makes it conductive. It's a P-type semiconductor when it's doped. And what we did is we made this little hoop on it that binds this molecule Paraquat, which is a herbicide. It's a nasty chemical, use it to kill weeds. You don't want to eat it, you don't want to have it on things you're smoking either, right? So, so it was actually big, big, when I was a, a, a teenager, they were, poison, they were killing plant, marijuana plants in California with this, and that was a real problem because people would still be smoking the marijuana and they were getting sick, okay? So, um, so I would say there was a burning desire to detect this. <laughs> ah, you guys, it, 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 the jokes will get better, okay? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so anyway, so here, what, when this binds there, you have two charges here, two positive charges. They electrostatically repel this. Also, this thing kind of steals some of the pi electrons in the system. A little bit more complicated, but the bottom line is it makes one of those barriers. You put it in there, boom, the conductivity goes down. It binds it very selectively in these little hoops that are designed to, to, to interact with that, and you get a sensor for that. Another ion that we're interested in is fluoride ion. Okay, treat water with fluoride. It's also a hydrolysis product of chemical weapons as well as nuclear enrichment processes. And so, uh, so fluoride ion here is the smallest anion, the smallest negatively charged you know, ion you can get. And so what we did is we created this structure here, a very complicated structure, where we designed these little caves in there that only were big enough for fluoride ion. And the fluoride interacts with these hydrogens there. They're, they're kind of protonic. They have positive charge. They hydrogen bond. In this case, they bind cooperatively. Two of them go in together. And they create this big negative charge. And what that is, that's like a fly trap. It basically sucks the carriers in, and they can't move. Okay? So you kill your carriers this way. The holes get trapped. And again, you can make something that's very sensitive. And so we've had a lot of fun with you know, this part of it, we can kind of go kind of a little crazy making fancy chemical structures and we've made many more than I'm showing here right here. But you might ask, okay, why am I you know, hedging out this that we can't really make this a reality? And there are some big problems with this, unsolved problems. One is that when you bring any two materials together, you know, if they're dissimilar materials, you usually have some barriers, some electronic problems at those interfaces, okay? And, and so there's intrinsically a resistive element here at these junctions between just a molecule and a metal, whether it's gold, you know, one of the best metals at making electrical contacts or any other metal. There's some real problems there. In fact, is when you start making sensors with things like this, you might find that this is dominating all of the resistance. And that doesn't, re that doesn't have the molecular recognition, the thing that's designed to basically pull that one molecule out we're looking for and recognize it, it will give us just noise. And the other thing is that, it, that molecules, if you can you know, dissolve them and put them places, they don't like to stay in an ordered position. 
there's something called the second law of thermodynamics. That says in any closed system, things tend to higher states of disorder, unless you put energy into them. This is a very highly ordered system. So just like your, your bedroom at home, if you don't put energy into it, it descends into chaos, right? You have to put energy to keep your room clean. And in fact, it is the same is true here. That's the second law. You can use that on your parents and say, why aren't you room clean? I'm so, sorry, second law of thermodynamics is, is running over me here. And, uh, and uh, you can try that. You might not get away with it. OK. OK, so we were frustrated with this idea that we had, you know, these trying to put these molecules between two electrodes one at a time. When we started doing this, you know, more, you know 25 plus years ago. And, and then I came up with, well, let's just first just prove that wires are, are amplifiers. That basically when you string everything together like this, you get amplification. And so what I decided to do is we didn't want to do any contact to the molecules. We didn't want to touch them. And, but how can you interrogate them? Well, you can use light. So the idea was here that we take these molecules now, and we're, we're not going to use them in a conductivity mode. We're going to use them in a photochemical fashion. OK, so what we have is we have all the electrons, all the electrons that are doing bonding between the atoms. OK, we, we, there are a bunch of molecular orbitals there. They all basically mingle together, and you get a continuum of electronic states. We call that the valence band in semiconductor terms. And then you have the empty orbitals. Those are the orbitals that don't have electrons in them. Okay? And those are, are all now forming you know, kind of virtual states. There's nothing in them, but they're still you know, quantum mechanically, there are electronic states there. And those are called the conduction band. And when a photon comes in here, it can take an electron and it can kick it up into this. It'll absorb that energy. And we can create, and we leave behind it, a positive charge because the electron's up there. And there's, so there's the empty thing in the, the valence band and an electron run around in the conduction band. And in the materials we make, these two are stuck together. They're bound together. They're not able just to dissociate. They're electrostatically you know, coupled. There's also some electronic reasons for this. But nevertheless, they, they move around together. And they can zoom up and down this polymer. Now, if they don't find anything else to do, what will happen is eventually this electron will jump down again and you get off light. You get fluorescence. But if you run into different species that can do chemical reactions with this, then you can get different uh, results. You can make ones that actually shift the wavelength to a different color, that they might change locally the electronic structure of the polymer. Or you might do ones where we're doing things called electron transfer reactions. That is, this electron, if this molecule here creates an empty orbital in between, the electron can jump over and then jump back again and basically go boop, boop. And that just dissipates the energy rather in heat. OK, we're just basically doing electron transfer. It's exciting vibrational levels. It's dissipating the energy. It heats up the local environment. And no photons come off. And that's called quenching. We're quenching the fluorescence. OK, so let's just focus on that. And first, let me kind of just go through kind of a, you know, a rigorous demonstration that we did to prove that molecular wires amplify. And what we did is we took a small molecule like this that we synthesized. We used our paraquat again. And we have this little hoops that mine paraquat. And paraquat is a very powerful electron acceptor. So when the electron is up there in that high excited state, it can jump over onto the paraquat and then back again and quench the fluorescence. And so what you can get here is you can measure the equilibrium constant, essentially the, the association constant here, the binding constant of this, just through some fluorescence measurements. So now what we do is we take exactly the same structure and now we put it into a polymer. We make a whole bunch of different lengths of polymers. Made them, we separated them, made, made sure they were very precise. And then we did the same sorts of experiments. And what you find is that you get that additivity that I talked about. They're wired in series. And so up to a critical length here, you find that if a photon is absorbed, the energy can move along the polymer and find this paraquat and do the quenching. And we find that it can go over 140 units. You make it longer than 140 units, it can't find it. There are a couple reasons why it can't find it. These 
excited states don't live forever. They're always trying to basically give off light. There's a what we call a first order rate constant, the same as radioactive decay towards giving off that light. And it happened, that happens in actually a nanosecond. So these things move very fast. These happen and these processes happen in sub nanosecond and picosecond or less time frames. Now, initially, I was, you know, it was good, good measurement. Nobody had ever done anything like this, but I was disappointed because I wanted millions. I wanted to see that we could really just keep this going. It only went 140 units, we could make these longer and longer, and we tried everything. And then what I figured out though, I was so in love with my little wire idea between the two electrodes, and I was thinking of this as being the same thing, but it's not the same thing. Because when I have that wire between two electrodes, I put a voltage across it. The current's going one direction, right? That's one direction, and it's being driven. But here, I'm putting this energy into it, and this excited state doesn't know to kind of beeline it over there. It does a random walk. So it's basically like if I take a randomly a step forward and a step backwards, I won't reach that wall in an hour. It's really inefficient. So my excitations are going back and forth over the same place all the time. Still, it goes 140 units, but statistically, it's really inefficient. And so it turns out that if you can just go to three dimensions, where you now have you know, Cartesian coordinates, we just think this most simplistically, we, have, we, we went from one place and we have five new directions to go. I can go back one out of six times to the same place, but that's a very simplistic view. But the bottom line, once we get to this, now we're getting into the realm of many hundreds of thousands of fold amplification. And so we just designed these thin films. We made a new polymer now that this one it doesn't have all those fancy hoops, but what we did is we put this group on it that created little galleries between the polymer chains. So this is like a sponge of molecular dimensions, and what it can do is it can suck up just very small molecules that a single aromatic ring will fit inside there, suck in there, and then when you get this excited state, it can basically randomly diffuse through this, and it diffuses far enough, ideally it runs into one of these and it quenches. So we can get very high degrees of amplification. Okay, so what was our target? Well, when we designed this, we needed an application. And at the time, there was a thought that the really the best way to detect landmines would be to make a sensor, a chemical sensor. Because landmines are made mainly from plastic, anti-personnel mines. They're just a little tiny bit of metal. And if you're out there with a metal detector, there's enough metal objects that you just, you'll get one and a half false positives, that is you think you found something in every square meter, even in a remote area, okay? So there's just enough natural things to, to do this. And so, so dogs could smell though the landmines. So people thought, you know, there must be a chemical signature, dogs can smell it. Now the challenge was that the, the main explosive in landmines is TNT, trinitrotoluene here, and the blue means it has a lot of positive charge here. This has a lot of negative charge, showing the kind of red and yellow. And so the TNT can stick nicely to this polymer, so we thought that was good. But the trick is that TNT is really low volatility. It has only about five to eight parts per billion. Okay, that is you know, parts per billion in the atmosphere. And we're trying to detect a landmine where it's not at saturation, it's not 100 times less than that, it's not 1,000 times, it's like a million times lower than this. It's hard for quadrillion because the wind is blowing it away and you're gonna try and pick up this vapor over the top. But nevertheless, you can do that. TNT has that little kind of energy state in the middle where an electron can jump back and forth and quench the polymer and it works. And so I wanna show you here just the, some, first some data, okay? So this is data where we have a sensor, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. The person is set holding the sensor kind of downwind of where he thinks, where the, the way the wind's going from some TNT demolition blocks. They're all wrapped up in plastic. They're not just sitting TNT out. So you're only getting a little bit of TNT kind of creeping out through the plastic over time. And, uh, and this is what the signal looks like. And you might think that's kind of a strange, kind of noisy looking signal, okay? But in fact is this is exactly what you expect because the TNT 
can't saturate all the vapor around it. It isn't like there's this big plume of TNT coming out. There's just a trace amount of TNT. And this is the result of convection, okay? So to understand this, if, you know, 20 years ago people used to lecture, you know, holding cigarettes sometimes, if I were smoking a cigarette here, you would see a little filament of smoke, right? And eventually it would diffuse and you wouldn't see it anymore. That filament is where the heat is convection. So this is basically a filament of a little TNT vapor that's coming along and hitting our sensor before it hits that diffusion pattern, okay? So this is a filamentary pattern that you would expect from this, okay? And I think you'll, you'll just remember this when you, sometimes if you're gonna, you're walking somewhere and you smell something. So I do this because I'm around the chemistry building and if I smell something weird, I think something's going on. But you smell something and then you might come back and you say, and you can't smell anymore. Just remember that when you say, that's because you got a little filament in you and then boom, you, you disturb the environment with your you know, walking and now it's not there anymore. It was transient. Okay, so what do these sensors look like? Very simple. What we did is we took a glass tube, we put our polymer on the inside and we excite with light from the side. Now the, the tube, the glass, has a higher index than air, so all the light basically waveguides through the glass down to a detector. So we use this capillary tube, this little glass tube, as basically support and the waveguide for the material, for the light. And when we suck vapors in here, if they kill the fluorescence, we see a diminution in the fluorescence coming out the other side. Here's, all the guts of it are right here. This is just handheld batteries and computer and things like that. And then this is a vehicle that was going up and down the roads of Iraq when we, we invaded Iraq, we were having lots of problems with roadside bombs. I don't know, how many of you have seen the movie The Hurt Locker? Yeah, and that they had these little robots. Every one of those robots was fitted with one of our sensors. That's how you found, that was a very big, that was one of the elements they used in basically uh, determining uh, you know, where those bombs were and what was going on. But before that, to convince the military that this really works because they've been had a lot of people tell, selling them snake oil on how they could detect these bombs, we had to do a field test. And I want to show you the field test here, which was done you know, some years ago out in the desert of Arizona, a place called Yuma. And uh, there's a soldier who's been looking for, for explosives here with this, just basically duct taped our little device onto their vehicle. And, uh, and he knows there's explosives somewhere. Of course, you're gonna look under bushes, and here he's coming up to this bush, and he's gonna look to see if there are explosives there. Now, the clicking sounds like a Geiger counter. Higher frequency means more signal. slow close to the bush. Notice the wind's blowing the right direction. Looks like there might be something there. <laughs> Got to get a real snootful. But you can see it kind of went away. So he knows he's not right on top of the, the material. So we're going to get a little different angle to see if you can find exactly where it is. And now he gets a real serious snoot here. So it's time to celebrate. He's confident he found it. And then, and then you know, this, they didn't buy this sensor yet, so he's just trying to, I guess he's trying to test it for durability there and trying to break it on us. But nevertheless, that was a good field test. It proved to them that they could do this. So this has now been used in different platforms. This is an MIT company in robotics, it's called iRobot. The same company makes the little things that go and vacuum your floor for you, the same company. This is called the PackBot. This is a version they build that can look under cars, a lot of police forces, a lot of militaries use this. This is used in auto ch uh, checkpoints, and they offer a package that again has this sensor on it, okay? Um, Another, this is the sensor being used in the Reagan or the National Airport in Washington, D.C. We were using it for liquid explosives. And they said they basically, it was in 75 airports for a while, but now they went to a, 
another technology that's more bulk detection. I don't think it's, I'm not sure I feel safer with the other technology, but the, nevertheless, it was a decision they used because it's, it detects bulk, not trace, but ours had consumables. That is, they cost money. You had, to, you had to buy things to go into it. The other one, a ramen system, doesn't have consumables. It works underwater. Here's a case that we test in the Pacific Ocean with our, on a, on a robotic platform here uh, that's, that's, that the uh, Office of Naval Research has funded. And then uh, there's our sensor at the front here. And this light blue are GPS coordinates. And the convection current is clearly going this way. And this is the simulated mine ordinance. So you can find underwater sea winds. Right now, the way they do that is with trained dolphins, which are great, but they're very difficult to you know, acclimate, to transport from one place in the world to another uh, is a tricky thing. OK, so, so we went. I was talking originally about this. And then I got caught up in proving that they amplify. And part of that was I was getting a lot of grief when I was a system professor. People say, molecular wires amplify. You don't know what you're talking about. It's a crazy idea. It seemed pretty obvious to me. But I had to kind of rigorously prove to the world that I knew what an amplifier was and made them amplify. But I'm still in love with this idea. And, it's, and you know, it, it was something that we, we needed a different platform to kind of make it work. Because also our polymers, when they're in solution, they don't, they don't, they're not little sticks. They're more like coiled up string. And, and about you know, 15 years ago, really the, the field of carbon nanotubes got to a level where people could start using them. Okay? They were really curiosities originally, but they got to a level where people could start using them. And, they, and they're complicated materials still. We really have, this is still an area in its infancy. It's going to be going for a long time, but they're going to be everywhere. They're going to change you know, people's lives. They're a very, very important topic, carbon nanotubes. And so the ones I'm going to tell you about today are a couple different flavors. Ones are where you take just essentially one roll of, of a, a sheet of kind of chicken wire of carbon. We call that graphene. Just one layer of graphite. We call it graphene. And you basically can think about cutting up sections of them and rolling them up on each other to give you different types of nanotubes. And I'll show you kind of an animation what that looks like. That's really not how they're made. They're actually given birth as little cylinders. But nevertheless, they come in different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're actually metallic. That is, they have, they conduct electrons just like a metal. Other times they're more like the polymers I just showed you where you basically have to put charge into them. You have to put electrons or holes into them to make them conduct. But nevertheless, they're complicated materials. And then sometimes they're actually multi-wall. They have onion-like structures, and I'll show you that. But just to kind of show you kind of how you think about that material translating from one dimension into a tube, this is basically something we call a 5-5 armchair. This would be a, a metallic nanotube and how you can think about that. OK, so, so now back to my scheme. So this is what I kind of showed you, the equivalence of what I showed you before. We can imagine a nanotube. And we do chemistry on the, these nanotubes. I'll show you some of that a little bit. But we think about that. And we could basically have something bind to it that basically kills the conductivity and basically breaks the circuit. But Remember, it's really hard to put one thing between two electrodes. People have done this. One in a 1,000 of them work. We're going to actually work with what we call random nanowire networks, where we make these nanotubes and we plop them down. And we put a bunch of them between electrode. And what we're going to do is we're going to have these junctions. We're going to have places where the electrons to get from this electrode to that one are going to have to traverse a nanotube nanotube junction. And it turns out that's where most of the resistance is in this circuit. And so if we can do things here that maybe open that junction, it's almost equivalent of a mechanical switch, those old style mechanical switches where you're opening things, you can create a resistance that way. OK, so you might be asking, OK, is, you know, Swagger, are you just so in love with this idea you had as a graduate student? Is it really, is it really important? Well, I would argue it really is. These are, these are some of the most important types of sensors you can make. And it, and it fall into this class what we call chemiresistors. Okay, this is, this is something where we're just going to measure resistance changes of these molecules from here to there. A little more complicated device. I don't want to get into it. This, you forget about that gate electrode. This is a field effect transistor configuration. But, but initially, we're just going to look at resistance here. And if you can do that, 
That is something that is so simple that you can basically plug and play, put it into most any device. You're not going from optics to electrical back to electrical again. You're keeping everything electrical and it can be very low power. So I'm gonna show you today how you can take a cell phone at five centimeters, you can power the sensor and you can read it at five centimeters. Your cell phone projects enough power through its RF or as radio, an RF uh, radio frequency here to power this inductively. They can be as small as any integrated circuit. They're great for wireless networks. The key for us in chemistry is that they have to be selective, okay? Because if you're, you have a sensor that responds to everything, you've just got noise, right? You need something that pulls up only on the things you want. Okay, so again, that low power, we can do, you know, essentially inductively power the material. And this is basically central now to a lot of our thinking. And the reason this is so central is because we're all packing cell phones. We're all connected. The, you hear this term, the internet of things. And so ideally what you would like to know is everything about your environment, about the produce you're eating, about what the, the, you know, if you smell something outside, is it bad or is it good? Or what is your, what is your drinking water like? And you're gonna need connectivity to the computational resources and the data of, you know, the internet and the cloud to do that. So we want to connect everything. Now, we spent quite a bit of time doing kind of national security things. Chemical weapons, bombs, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an expert in both of those. Okay, and you know, it makes great cocktail conversation, but my wife has said to me like, gee, you know, I'm kind of tired of that. Can't you do something that's a little nicer than bombs and chemical weapons? And I thought, okay, let's go after things that are relevant to agriculture and food. It's actually a very big problem that your generation is gonna have to deal with. We have this exploding population, we have climate change, we have urbanization of agricultural, you know, resources and there's not enough food. And there's a lot of, there are a number of people in the world that spend you know, more than 80% of their money on just staying alive to get food. You don't spend nearly that much, right? You have, we in America, we, we, we have cheap food, but lots of places they don't. And so what we're really interested in is how can we kind of translate that connectivity, that internet of things to ways that can make real impact in food. You might want to have things in a smart refrigerator that are telling you that, gee, you know, you're at the grocery store, what, what's for dinner, you think about it, your refrigerator basically knows everything that's in there and it's quality. And it's saying, boy, that avocado, you know, it's perfect right now, a week it isn't gonna be, should make some guacamole, you know, you, and you're at the grocery store, so you think, what, I need some chips. Gonna make some guacamole. So, so that's a way because we, you know, basically in the first world nations, we throw away about 40% of our food. Okay, not good. We want to do optimal harvesting. We want to know, you know, how the plants are doing. We want to know if they're stressing. We can do dynamic pricing in grocery stores. Grocery stores often have things that they didn't lower the price. They could have moved them off the shelf. They get old. They basically throw them out. You'll find lots of, lots of rotten produce behind any grocery store. Okay, so how do you go about doing this with a sensor? Well, it turns out the most important gas here is a gas called ethylene. And ethylene, pretty simple molecule. It's just that is ethylene. Half the stuff in this room is derived from that molecule. It's a feedstock. It's the most produced chemical, organic chemical in the planet. It also happens to be a universal hormone for plants. Kind of weird looking hormone, but it is what plants respond to. Plants generate this, and you might have heard this, 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 this saying, it takes one bad apple. Have you ever heard that? I mean, it kind of means it makes one, one, one of you being bad and the whole, the whole party's ruined, right? Well, it turns out one premature ripe apple in a box will cause all the other apples to ripen prematurely and rot, 
okay? So that one apple, really it only takes one apple that's prematurely ripened, and I'll come to that in just a moment, that can spoil everything. But just to show you that there are, there, are these, there are these relationships between ethylene and ripening, here's basically a profile for a pear that when it's really green, it doesn't give off much ethylene. When it gets ripe, it gives off more. All these, all these fruits have different, uh, different profiles. Some of them kind of go more linear. Some of them peak and then go down. Some of them do these kind of, you know, these kind of threshold curves here. But they all do these different things. And it's much broader than this fruit. It's when flowers ripen. Flowers are really sensitive to ethylene, part per billion levels of ethylene. This is all part per million. Uh, so, so it's really, really important. So now I can go to cocktail parties and talk about flowers rather than chemical weapons, and that makes my wife happy. Okay, so, so how do we do this? Well, what we did is we, we, stuck, we did chemistry. We stuck some pretty sophisticated copper compounds to the sidewalls of nanotubes. And these compounds were generated kind of through bioinspiration. That is because the enzymes, the active side of the enzymes, have copper compounds that have similar oxidation states. And we did a whole fruit ripening study. And we, we showed that we could do this at different temperatures over time. We did all the different profiles. We hit all the profiles that worked really well with a single sensor. And that was actually a pretty big deal to me because carbon nanotubes, they have these, these charges that move in them. So they're really sensitive to things like humidity, other polar molecules. Ethylene has no dipole. It's not a polar molecule. Carbon nanotubes do not respond to ethylene. So we had to pull up that one signal over all these complicated background, but we did it. And I think you know that if I blindfolded you and put a banana to your nose and a pear to your nose, I think you could tell the difference. And you're not smelling ethylene. You're smelling esters, which are polar compounds. And so this was a pretty good, a good result. It led to the founding of a small company called C2Sense that's just, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's here, a spin out of MIT. And our first product are these little boxes, okay? These little boxes have that kind of electrode array that I showed you on the previous slide inside of them. And they are used to monitor Apple cold storage rooms. So right now, if you have an apple today that you got from the grocery store, nice crisp apple, you might think, oh, that must have been flown in from South America. And no. It was picked in the United States last September. And it tastes just as good now and just as crisp as it used to. And, and that, the reason for that is what we can do is we can take these apples before they're too ripe. You can put them in a cold storage room. You treat them a little bit of this molecule here. That, re, that goes into the same receptors ethylene would go and it reacts with them and it shuts them down. That's the product of this company called Agrifresh. So you shut them down. And then hopefully you, you monitor the atmosphere, make sure the ethylene isn't coming up. So if a few of the apples got too ripe, you can't quench it. You can't shut it down. If they start giving off ethylene, basically the whole place is going to just mushroom. You got all those, those, those apples together, and they're going to prematurely ripen. And if you know the ethylene comes up, then you have to make applesauce or cider out of it. And there's about a million dollars of apples in each one of these rooms that we do this. So there are 25,000 rooms in the world that this company is under contract for. And basically, so what we do is we monitor to make sure they got the proper dose of this. We can detect that selectively. And then after they dose that, then we wait and make sure the ethylene isn't coming up. And when we can do that, and once that's set, then they put the room under kind of depleted oxygen, cool it down, and lock it up until they want the apples. And you open it up, and the apples are perfect, OK? And so this was done. It was done now in 12. We did a test in the summer, southern hemisphere as well as the northern hemisphere. We did, just completed a summer, southern hemisphere uh, studies last, last spring. And uh, now it's, it's, it's going, going further. OK. So what other things you can do with nanotubes? OK. Well, I mentioned that we, we have these multi-wall nanotubes. And I mentioned that we also like to do chemistry on the surface of them. OK. So let me tell you a little bit about how we can take a multi-wall nanotube, kind of this onion structure, and basically make sensors out of it that, that now aren't just designed to detect one thing. So the ethylene thing, we put that special molecule on it to detect that one thing. Okay? But now we want something that's more 
akin to kind of the tricorder in the old Star Trek movies that Mr. Spock used to have, that he would tell the atmosphere and life readings and everything. So we'd like to have something like that, or something that maybe is as diverse as a nose of a dog or a person. And so what we want to do is we want to take these multi-wall nanotubes, we take the yellow outer rim here, and we're going to basically staple things onto it. We're going to chemically anchor things to the surface, and we're going to anchor a bunch of different structures on there that help us take chemical space and spread it out. So we want to have things that recognize that these, these have this, those hydrogens are hydrogen bond donors. That is, they'll, they'll hydrogen bond to things like esters and ketones. This, where you have all these oxygens together, that's just perfect for a hydrogen to sit in the middle. This is a hydrogen bond acceptor material. It'll recognize things that can donate hydrogen bonds, things like that's a carboxylic acid. We just look, look at some things that just have general polarity to them. And then little kind of hoops like this, that this, has, this is actually a little cup-shaped thing that will bind aromatic things like benzene, toluene, xylene, nasty compounds or chlorinated compounds, things that you might find from cleaning supplies. And then just alkanes, just, you know, oil. Okay, and just, in all these, we gotta worry about water. So we, we worry about water a lot. We have good ways to detect that, but I won't really, I won't go into that today. But let's just show you kind of how we, you know, do this. So we take these nanotubes, we design brand new reaction. Reaction is pretty complicated. I don't want to go into it, but the bottom line is we can do this chemistry where we can staple all these different things on there. And remember this one right here, this is what we call a crown ether. That's one that basically has, you know, hydrogen bonds in the middle. That recognizes things like alcohols. And then if we have this one over here, we have this really long alkyl chain, C12 carbons long with the sulfur, which is pretty, not very polar either we can make these basically kind of greasy alkane chain type materials. And so if we take those and now make chemical sensors, we get these types of profiles. And, and what I'm showing you here are just, you know, basically the naked nanotubes, nothing on them, and then one that just has a very simple functionalization, one that has that long alkyl chain and one that has the crown ether. And I expose it to decane, which is just a hydrocarbon. And what you can see is the nanotubes don't have any response without the functionalization. And the one that has the greasy nanotubes has the biggest response because like likes like. Now notice there is some response here though. It's not perfect. It's not completely perfect. In fact, it's all molecular recognition isn't perfect except for DNA. That's why DNA is, I mean, your, your enzymes, they're not perfect. Your proteins are not perfect. DNA really is perfect. That's why it's our master code. So, so this is kind of expected. We're, we're mortals. We can't, you know, beat, you know, things like this. And it also makes sense, though, that we take that crown ether, the one that was supposed to, to, to bind alcohols, we put that in, and boom, that gets a bigger response. Now, what you're seeing here is a reduction in current that's going through here. So I'm putting a fixed voltage. This is conductance, and so I have a negative sign here. So what's happening here is we're reducing the current. And what's, what that is, is because we have these nanotubes and we're basically putting other groups between them, we're sucking groups in there, and we're spreading them out a little bit. We're opening that junction, that switch. We're opening that switch. Now, we can do this, I could go through data like this for basically a whole bunch of different nanotubes and different solvents. We just basically went through the laboratory and used different solvents, and we can get something like this. This is just a heat map, okay? Now, this, you can't make heads or tails out of it. Right? The only thing that's important about this is every row and every column is different. Because we put these different things in there and we spread out chemical space. And so now what you can do is you can take this and do a mathematical treatment of it. You can do linear algebra. You can basically take linear combinations of this and you solve for things called eigenvectors. I don't know, how, have any of you had linear algebra? Oh, wow, that's good. I didn't have it until I was like a... <laughs> I didn't have it until I was a third year, you know, undergraduate, but you guys are ahead of the game here. I didn't go to MIT either. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so you take these linear combinations and you basically solve for these eigenvectors that have what we call maximum variance. You're trying to, to pick things that have the biggest variance here. And then what you can do is you can basically replot the same data here in reduced dimensionality. Rather than having, you know, an n by n matrix now of data, which you really can't comprehend visually, we can plot it in two dimensions where we have these different, you know, principal components here. 
And so now what we can do is we can categorize things. And it's kind of similar to your nose. I mean, you know the smell of chocolate. Lots of different chocolates, you'll recognize them, you know, as chocolate. It doesn't have to be just one brand. That's because they all have some characteristic that your brain has learned doing the same computations we did here to say, that's chocolate or that's, you know, coffee. Okay, so, so let's now think about this here that uh, as we look at this, we say, okay, I've done these, circled these different things. These are aliphatic. These are esters and ketones. And you might say, wait a minute, professor, aren't you cutting things a little close right there? You're drawing your circles in a very suggestive way. But let's just look and see what that is. That is dihexyl ether. So that is six carbon ch alkane chain, you know, oil, one oxygen, another six carbons. It belongs there, okay, because it's really kind of, it's not clear which category to put it into. This one also is carbon, 10 carbon link chain with one polar ketone. This is octanol, eight carbon chain, one OH on the end. This is a benzene here that has methyls around it. Okay, it's an aromatic ring, but it has these methyls. The methyls make it look like it's a hydrocarbon. So in fact, this really properly represents everything. And so, we, so it's possible to make things that really have this kind of universal sensor type scheme. Okay, so the last part I promised you I would tell you about cell phones, okay? And so what we use here is we just use a commercial kind of off the shelf RFID tag, you might have seen things in this when you buy things from stores, they're meant to trigger these alarms, these little kind of, like, when you go out of the door, they'll trigger those, so that's an RFID signal. And so what you have here is an antenna, okay, that's coupled to a capacitor that's just there to tune the circuit. This is how you get the, the resonant RF circuit here. And in the middle here, you have an integrated circuit. That integrated circuit just has like a serial number. It just says, I'm chip number one, two, three, four. Okay, and so what we do, the simplest way we've done this, we've done it a few different ways, is we just basically cut the, sim the, cut the signal here. We cut that, we detune the circuit. It isn't really a resonant circuit anymore. And then what we do is we basically wire it up with nanotubes and reestablish the circuit. And now as we change the resistance in that nanotubes, the circuit frequency shifts. Now your cell phone, it's designed for a near field thing. It works at 13.56 megahertz. Okay, that's with Apple Pay or whatever you use your cell phone for, RF wise. That's what it is. And so what we can do is we can tune it either to that or away from that. And so what we can do is we can make it to where your cell phone can read it or not read it. And you might think that's a pretty dumb sensor, right? Okay. It turns out you, you, it could be a little bit more sophisticated than that. We have to learn how to program cell phones. We actually work with Samsung phones, even though I'm an Apple guy, as you can see, because Apple won't let you really program their cell phones. So we have to use Samsung cell phones for this. Um, but you can see, the, uh, I think it is, I don't I think it's the same. I'm not sure, this is probably just off the web. But um, anyway, we can turn them on and off, okay? But let me show you just a demo here, a video that my student who did this work initially uh, did with me that really shows kind of the power of this. And again, I'm back to explosives, okay? Bad husband, I know, but I'm back to explosives, and uh, he's gonna show you how you might use this. On the left, we have an unmodified control tag. This tag will always be readable. On the right, we have a sensor tag. This tag will only turn on in the presence of an explosive. Notice how the phone does not read the sensor tag when the box is empty. Now I will place an improvised explosive mimic into the box. This mimic is chemically equivalent to many common explosives. A little too chemically. Again, scanning the control tag indicates the system is functioning properly. Now, with the explosive material in the box, the sensor has turned on, and we see the message verifying that an explosive material has been detected. Okay. So this information could automatically be relayed to the authorities. Okay, so, so that's a real-time detection. It gives you time, stamp, and position. So one of the goals I have, the same technology, imagine this for pollution. Imagine we get community groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Brownies out, you know, testing water. And boom, they're uploading everything to the web. And there might be some noisy things, but we know exactly what time they did it, where they were, 
you want to map out and find a point, a source of where pollution is coming from, this is the way to do it. So we have some real dreams for this. And I want to show you that I am kind of trying to be a good husband and, and I am working on food. Um, we, just, uh, we just actually, our latest thing is to look at food packaging, okay, to put these things into food packaging. And here you might know, you know, you go to the grocery store, you're probably used to it, but it didn't used to be this way. You go to the produce aisle and you'll see a lot of, a lot of things in plastic containers, sealed up tightly, plastic bags. The reason they're doing that, they're not trying to make more money on, well, they are always trying to make more money, but they're not trying to stiff you with, you know, buying things loose to get you to pay more. They actually have longer shelf life when they package them up that way because there's something called modified atmosphere packaging. They deplete the oxygen inside these. And, and so what we did is we came up with a way to determine if the packaging was working. Because a lot of times you get this stuff home and it smells awful because the packaging was compromised and oxygen got in. And they, the material basically decayed because microbial activity went to work. And so what we can do is we can basically make things that can detect when the packaging is compromised. And this is just the RF gain out of the circuit. But you can set your threshold here to say, okay, when it hits a certain ming, you know that, boom, don't buy that salad. We demonstrated this for broccoli and green tea, but you know, one that has high humidity, one that has low humidity, and, and it works. And we're actually looking to kind of commercialize some kind of version of this technology here and bring it to the masses. Okay, so one of the things here, I'm up here talking, but faculty members at a research university, particularly like MIT, we're really kind of like small corporations. I'm kind of the CEO, CTO, COO, but but this is the corporation. This is the, this is the people that do all the work. I get to present on it. But these are the people that did, do, did a bunch of the work. And you can see they all look happy. They, all, they, they dress like this every day. We're a classy group. <laughs> and, uh, but they're the real heroes. And uh, they're the real brains behind this. OK, so with that, it's uh, time for me to quit. And I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, yes, that's a very good point. You, you, you should take a business degree, too, in addition to a science degree. That's a good thing to do, by the way. I think I, I wholly do that. So, so pa food packaging is really cost-sensitive, which you're, I think you're queuing on. And the fact is, more than a penny is a problem. The biggest problem there is that integrated circuit. The integrated circuit itself is really cheap. It's actually positioning it and fabricating the thing that has the integrated circuit. So there's some other ways around this. Imagine just coupled antennas that you print and you, you, you take, so we have to go with integrated circuit free versions of this. And we're actually working on that with a collaboration we have here with a mechanical engineering group that is really good at printing and making things. We need to also do it at really high speed and really high fidelity. So we want, we want crisp, we want it the same way every time, really narrow frequency with things called the line width, how wide the frequency is, is something called a Q quality factor, Q factor. We want that so we have the best signal right where we want. And so that's the next generation that's going to get rolled out. Hopefully, commercially, it's not going to be this because these cost 25 cents. They're 25 times too expensive. But there are things that you can use it for, for pharmaceuticals that you want to make sure they're, they're okay, they didn't have a, temp, you have a time temperature indicator or something like that, no problem. Actually, cosmetics, no problem. But food, you gotta be cheap. Yes? So oh. if you're having like this long chain, and like if one of the sensors goes off to like detect this chemical or something, um, how durable is it if like one, of, if one critical point just like malfunctions and it says that there's a chemical in the atmosphere and there isn't? Yeah, the, you know, there are always going to be, what you're talking about is a false positive, okay? And, and uh, you know, sometimes false positives can be disruptive. Sometimes, you know, the, what you have to always think about, there's something called a receiver operator curve that people use when they do these things. And there's, there's kind of a trade-off between, you know, probability detection, probability of false alarm, okay? So something like, you know, explosive detection, 
you're willing to accept a few false alarms to never miss one, right? There might be other times where a false alarm, I mean, you miss something that's not a big deal, it just means you, you have some loss. So, so there's always gonna be things like that, but one of the things that we, we do want the most robust sensor we can have, the things that are false alarming all the time, it's gonna be like the boy that cried wolf, nobody will listen to you. So you can't have that, but you also, if you can make really cheap sensors, which a lot of things we can be really cheap, you now have basically redundancy. Okay, so one of the things, for example, and this is something that hasn't, it hasn't come to fruition yet, but people would like, they're trying to put sensors in your cell phone for air quality. It's one of the things that, that people are thinking about. And that's not too easy because I just had this in my pocket and you know, I'm exuding vapors here, okay? You're, we all are, we all are. I mean, we're biological systems, we're, we're giving off stuff, right? And so, you know, so, uh, so, so how do you do that? Well, you say the accelerometer tells you when you have it up here and then it basically re-equilibrates. And I've asked people about this, said, you know, but when you have, you know, a million of these over a region, you can do the statistics and you can decide which ones are aberrant and which ones aren't. And so the cloud, actually, the big data aspect of this does cut you some latitude. And that's one thing that's kind of going in the favor of kind of technology. There might be a way that the information part can cut us kind of materials, sensor people, a little bit of slack, but still, you, you definitely want to have the fewest number of false alarms and the highest degree of, of probability detection you can. Uh, so we, we do calibrate, we do calibrate. So, so, so a lot of times people will ask me, you know, can you detect anything? I mean, that might be another way of like, what are the limits? And, and I would say in principle, yes, you could probably somehow, some way with different methods. They might all not be chemi, chemi resistors. There might, you might have to go to a different method. Um, but there are things that are harder. I mean, one of the unsolved challenges is methane. All the fracking, methane's a greenhouse gas, it's getting away. Methane's a slippery little molecule that doesn't bind anything. And it doesn't really, at least that one has a double bond in it. That's actually like a handle. But methane really just has, it's just hydrogens around it. So, so there are things, there are real limits to what we know we can detect and not. But there are limits to the molecular recognition. Now, with regard to calibration, if you have a robust manufacturing method, usually you can have some idea on what's, you know, what their, their, their limit, you, we make things reproducibly over and over again, and you just calibrate, you just basically, by design, you do a calibration, and then if your process is robust enough, then you can be assured that it will respond the way you want. Was that um, is it? So this is we talked a lot about the sensing. Uh, is, there, uh, is there any work on actuation? Any sort of like can you like print smell or something? Is that possible? That will be one question. The second one is, what do you foresee like in the next twenty years or something? Should we expect some crazy products now with this? Okay, so print print smell. I don't. I mean, I think people fragrances are complicated. First of all, fragrances are very complicated. Perfumes. Yeah, perfume, perfumers, I mean, a perfume you buy, it's not one compound. It's like 70 compounds. Okay, they're very complicated. So and there are people that, you know, do, do work in fragrances. I, uh, but, but what's, what's the, the, big, the big thing? I mean, I, I think, uh, well, if I would say that I think sensors everywhere is really important. We want to know everything. Chemical sensors everywhere. That's my central thinking about this. I think another big part of that is, though, that when we start connecting everything is privacy issues. Where are we going to draw the line, right? Where are you going to draw the line? I think you all have a right, though, to know. I mean, I think as people, we have a right to know what we're breathing in, what we're eating, you know, the quality checks on everything, okay? So I think that there's going to be a demand for that, and it's going to be a very integrated part of our life in the future. Um, I mean, we're not the only people working in this area. So it's, a, it's an evolving area. And I think with the Internet of Things, it's actually people have started to kind of really pay attention.
to chemical sensors because they're all trying to figure out how do we capitalize on this, and they're saying, what information do you want? You know, there's only, most of the things, I mean, we know how to get taxis this way, we know how to do everything else, but the, 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 our environment is something that people really care about, and I think that's gonna be a big part of our future and something we should care about. Thank you. From each one of the course, somebody who hasn't been down before, what are you? Bob, come on down. UAV? Race car? You race car? Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, great. Always good. Okay, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your time here, folks.